So, Bejo, I know um, you've been a co-founder and CEO of several startups in the past, um, including Automatic, which was acquired after six years. Um, could you tell us a bit about how cash, cash flow reports or cash flow projections played a part in achieving uh, milestones within your startup journeys? All right, so Ketsi, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, if you, you know, look at my previous company, Automatic, uh, cash flow planning and cash flow management was especially important because uh, we made hardware, right? And so when you make hardware, you're uh, building up inventory, right? And if it's a consumer product that we sold, in the Apple store, the Best Buy, and you know, you know, a bunch of uh, places like that, which mm -hmm. meant that we had to make decisions about building up inventory, try to forecast demand, and uh, that makes cash flow management all the more important, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't want to build up too much inventory and then you know be sitting on that for a while. And also the timing you know, in which you get paid, it could mm -hmm. be anywhere up to 90 days after you've uh, given delivery of the product to uh, distributors, in some cases, you know, it could be many months until the product gets sold through in the retailers, outlets, and things like that, right? So uh, that was a business where cash flow management was incredibly important. And actually, the business I'm building now, Airbase, which is a management a business, uh, you know, I learned a lot about finance and accounting and financial, financial operations when I was building my previous company and had to kind of deal with some of these uh, existential uh, things around cash flow management and things like that. Right. Yeah. Um, and so with Airbase, you said you learned a lot about financing from uh, the previous businesses. How did you come up with the concept for Airbase? So again, so as I was uh, you know, building my previous company, yeah, I'm an engineer, I'm a product person by training, and uh, you know, I didn't know anything about finance or accounting. I didn't know the difference between cash and accrual accounting when I started my previous company, but uh, I was forced to learn, right? Because as I mentioned, uh, you know, all of these aspects of building up inventory, cash pl uh, planning, working capital kind of management, mm -hmm. that was um, you know, very important uh, for the business. And as a venture funded company, you know, I never wanted to be sitting in a board meeting saying, oops, we screwed up, we built up too much inventory, we didn't plan properly, right. you know, I need you to bridge me for mm -hmm. another uh, six months or whatever it is, right? So I made the effort to learn about how that planning happens, how we built up uh, inventory, how we did the planning. And, as we scaled the company and I built out a finance and accounting team, I was always curious about what is it these people do? And, and uh, but the deeper I dug, the more frustrating it was to me, especially on uh, the spend side of things. Like mm -hmm. you know, we were an unprofitable company investing in growth and uh, I was careful about how we spent money, what we spent money on and things like that. And just getting visibility into that and figuring out what we spent money on, staying on top of things. Mm -hmm. Overall, was very frustrating, right? And uh, obviously, I was building a different company then. It was a connected car platform. It mm -hmm. had you know, nothing to do with uh, financial operations, but mm -hmm. uh, the problem was kind of frustrating enough for me that I went into my ideas notebook to look into when I had the uh, time finally. And mm -hmm. uh, we did in 2017. You know, we sold the business to Sirius XM, and after that, you know, I started digging into what I was going to do next. And mm -hmm. this was an opportunity that I kept coming back to, and I had a thesis about how the overall spend management problem uh, could be solved. That is how businesses spend money and how they manage it and all of that. I spent about uh, three or four months speaking with a few dozen controllers and VPs of finance and CFOs and, and kind of validated my hypothesis and mm -hmm. long story short, came to the conclusion that yeah, I could spend maybe another 10, 12 years of my life uh, you know, building a business uh, in this domain. Right. right. I know that's amazing to see how you know, you can find um, the gaps of where things can uh, be improved from one business to the other and, and jump to the next thing. So that's really um, amazing. And in terms of um, being acquired, just to focus on automatic a little bit, I know when businesses are acquired, um, typically they want to see the cash flow statements as well. So did that process also help you build out any of Airbase's functionality? So ultimately, you know, the value that Airbase provides has less to do with the uh, acquisition process itself, okay. right? Because right. ultimately, you know, a strategic uh, you know, acquirer sees value in the business. And uh, yes, they look at, you know, cash flow and they look at uh, a variety of other aspects about the business. Mm -hmm. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, you know, so this exam was a $30 billion public company. Right. And uh, for them, even though it was a pretty sizable uh, acquisition, it wasn't, uh, a huge in, you know, for a company at that scale, right? a public company at that scale. And 
And so I'm sure the cash that we had and things like that might not have been as uh, you know important to them. But you know, from the perspective of the day-to-day -day running of the business, you know, okay. it, it absolutely influenced my thinking about the problem we're solving at Airbase. And the simple uh, you know thing there is when you're running a business, mm -hmm. most companies don't have real-time visibility mm -hmm. uh, into uh, how they're spending money and the decisions that they make that ultimately impacts cash flow uh, in the business, right? And mm -hmm. you know, as you're growing as a business, if you have a budget mm -hmm. and you have a number of people in the company who have their own budgets, you know, it's very difficult for them to answer the question, say, in the middle of the month, if it's the 15th of the month, how do they answer the question of, hey, how much of my budget have I actually spent? And now I have to make a decision about spending more money. Mm -hmm. Am I going to go over budget if I commit to this? And that's a very hard question for them to answer because most businesses are spending money across many different systems, right? So they have spent happening in corporate cards. They have spent happening through a system like bill.com because invoices are coming in and they're processing the invoices and paying it out. Uh, you know, employees are reimbursing money that they have spent on their own and that's happening in a system like Expensify. So there are all these different systems that, that are involved in the process of how money is spent and you have you know, no way to get real-time visibility in one place in right. terms of all the money that you are spending, right? And so you have to wait till the end of the month, you have to wait till the books are closed and, mm -hmm. and the impact that kind of substandard decisions have around how you spend money, that has a direct impact on cash flow uh, you know, once you get to that uh, end of the month and now you are surprised by mm -hmm. uh, not being on budget and things like that. Yeah. And yeah, that experience, uh, obviously it was frustrating to me that we couldn't do that in a better way. And mm -hmm. I couldn't also hold the budget owners and, and people in the company accountable because mm -hmm. how can you blame somebody for going over budget when they don't have the right tools to, to kind of get that visibility that they need to make better decisions, right? right? And so right. it was just, uh, you know, there's a good learning experience uh, in terms of how you could potentially solve that problem in a better way. Right, right. yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, so I was wondering, um, how can new businesses or startups lay the foundations for um, a streamlined and, and strong spend management and cash flow process, like if they're just starting out? Look, I, I don't want to kind of just pitch Airbase too hard and say just start, start off by using Airbase, but uh, right. you know, if, even if you know, people don't use Airbase, the mm -hmm. first question I would ask is, uh, you know, do you have the right control visibility mm -hmm. uh, into how you're spending money, right? Like mm -hmm. ultimately in the early days of any business, mm -hmm. uh, unless you're the kind of business that's profitable from day one, uh, you know, that's great, but uh, not every business is, and you are investing money, spending money on the business and controlling that burn or how much you are spending is incredibly important, especially if you're a you know, venture funded company, the defining characteristic of a venture funded company is growth at all costs, right? And so you're willing to lose money in the early mm -hmm. years to kind of invest in that growth. Mm -hmm. And especially for those kind of companies, it's incredibly important to have a fairly good idea of how much am I burning? How much am I spending? And am I doing uh, things uh, the right way? And am I putting in the right processes and inculcating the right spend culture in the company from day one, right? And mm -hmm. In the absence of good tools where people can't kind of get uh, visibility into hey, how much of the company's money am I spending, right? Mm -hmm. In modern businesses, nobody can answer that question, right? Like mm -hmm. down from an individual employee to maybe a manager of teams. If you ask a manager, hey, how, much, how much is your team spending on behalf mm -hmm. of the company? They don't have the answer to that. Then right. all the way up to the CEO, CFO, even they have to wait until the end of the month when all these kind of uh, monthly close process happens and the financial statements come out. Mm -hmm. Nobody can at any given time go answer the question of, hey, how much am I spending? But if you put in place a, a system which allows every individual to ask and answer that question, how much of the company's money am I spending? Where am I spending it? You know, it's so much easier to build accountability into uh, the company when mm -hmm. money is being spent, right? all the way from an individual to a manager to a department head. CEO, CFO, if everybody knows mm -hmm. under my purview, in my sphere of influence, how much money am I spending? Uh, you know, the spend culture of the company changes. It really helps the finance and accounting people mm -hmm. uh, hold people accountable, right. which in the absence of good tools and process and real-time mm -hmm. visibility is just hard to do, right? And, and you can't mm -hmm. do that. And finance and accounting teams end up carrying the burden of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, oversight all the time and and that's not really a 
you know, uh, fair thing for them to be able to do when they don't even know why a lot of the money is being spent by people mm-hmm. in different parts of the company, right? And ultimately, uh, you know, if you have a good uh, process and good habits around mm-hmm. that from day one, right? It also really helps uh, from a cash flow perspective, and you hold on to more uh, of that cash for yourself. You can invest it in growth, and you know, mm-hmm. and and that's kind of how we think about serving our customers is can we influence and help them kind of survive longer because they're just being smarter with the money that they're spending. Right. right. So yeah, visibility and, and um, transparency is definitely the, the critical thing they should look at versus whatever platform they use, even if it's Google spreadsheets, although I hope it's not, um, <laughs> you know, they need to be able to see and also collaborate with other departments because otherwise things get siloed. Um, yeah, that makes, that yeah. makes perfect sense. Um, so what about, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that would be, make sense for companies that are already kind of more established. Um, but are, is there anything maybe a legacy company should do to kind of transfer to, to these, um, kind of newer programs or to update their systems, if that makes yeah, sense? It ultimately comes down to, uh, is that the right time to prioritize uh, okay. a project, right? And, uh, uh, as, you know, if you're growing quickly, um, mm-hmm. it definitely makes sense to potentially Right. Put in the effort to migrate away from a set of siloed systems if you're already in that position into uh, mm-hmm. in, in a consolidated platform uh, you know, like Airbase. Because uh, otherwise, the mm-hmm. typical way in which companies tend to solve the problem is by throwing bodies at the problem. Right? You have to go hire multiple people because mm-hmm. the problem becomes that much more acute as you're scaling a company mm-hmm. and, and you're, you end up hiring a bunch of you know, AP people and, and, you know, there's one person focused only on processing the incoming invoices and if you scale even large, you know, mm-hmm. as a, to a larger scale, even one person may not be enough and there are different people focused on different siloed areas of spend and things like that. And so uh, how do you get ahead of the problem? That's one question you should potentially ask yourself uh, is, uh, can I even have the right systems and processes in place so that, you know, the uh, uh, scale does not lead me to kind of hire people uh, proportional to uh, the overall scale of the business. Like that's not a good place to be in uh, ultimately, right? And Mm -hmm. that's one way to think about it. The other way is uh, just if you want to drive more control, more visibility, more automation, the overall process, uh, you know, that's another good motivation for companies to think about investing in that migration. And finally, it's just about happiness of the finance and accounting teams, right? Because uh, you know, and I saw this in my previous company. Unfortunately, a lot of accounting people, especially, get pushed into this role of just becoming glorified data entry uh, people in the first week of every month, uh, which is largely because of the failure of the tools that they are expected to use, right? And if only there were better tools, which uh, you know, avoided a lot of the manual work that they typically have to do, uh, they could really focus on being partners uh, to the business, think, help them think more strategically. And, and those are all the things that they want to spend time doing uh, more of anyway, right? And so, uh, and, and so if, if any finance leader is thinking about the happiness uh, and motivation of your team, that's another more you know, kind of good reason uh, to invest in that uh, change, right? Right, yeah, 100%. The technology allows you to leverage your people better and, and support them. And that in turn goes back into the company and becomes a positive cycle. Yeah. Um, so coming back to Airbase a little bit, um, I wanted to talk about how Airbase um, manages its own finances outside of spend. Like what exactly do you track um, when you're, you're tracking cash flow for Airbase? So, uh, we are in the very happy position ultimately of being a well-funded uh, mm-hmm. company, I right? So we're a venture-funded company. And uh, while we have very good discipline around how we spend money, and mm-hmm. obviously we use Airbase, uh, to do that, and there's good visibility. People across the company, uh, you know, based on their kind of role in the company, have access to all the information they need to make good decisions around how they are spending money. And you know, Airbase is helping uh, with a lot of that. Uh, and, and and you know, one of our core values as a company is to be frugal, and and that comes through in a lot of the decisions uh, that we make. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it, it it starts with the culture of the company itself and the spend culture of how you uh, think about uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how you spend money. Uh, and the 
cash flow at the end of the day and the outcome, you know, it's something that is a result of actions that you take mm-hmm. over a period of time, right? And right. Uh, so, you know, so from that perspective, uh, it's not something that I uh, worry a lot about, right? Yes, are there you know, improvements that we can make in terms of uh, the process of how we get real-time visibility and things like that? I know of companies that are kind of low-margin businesses that aren't uh, as well-funded and things like that. Right. where the finance and accounting people have to do weekly cash flow reporting and, and those kinds of things mm-hmm. uh, to the management team so that there's a much closer kind of scrutiny of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we haven't, uh, at our scale of growth as a business and, mm-hmm. and given some of the uh, you know uh, luxury that we have around uh, being uh, well-funded, we haven't had to kind of do those kinds of things. But I fully anticipate that as we scale uh, mm-hmm. you know, much larger business those are the kinds of things that you'll also uh, have to do over time right so as you scale it'll likely become more granular as well in terms of your reporting to ensure that everything's being covered exactly yeah um so what would you recommend um for startups who are trying to forecast future scenarios again it depends on the nature of the business i think it's it's a little hard to kind of provide uh, you know uh, a single answer that applies to every kind of startup Right, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, if you were to pick a B two B SaaS business, which is what we consider ourselves to be, which is a popular business model, if you're a software as a service, subscription revenue kind of uh, service, mm-hmm. uh, well, the thing that we are always trying to get smart about, yes, the overriding question is how fast can we grow, and what are the levers that influence that growth, right? And ultimately, what you're trying to now forecast is uh, you know, what is new revenue that we can add and, and new bookings that we can add in a certain period of time. And why do we think we can do that? And then, you know, of course you come up with an aggressive goal and then you try to back into, to be able to accomplish that. What are the inputs that, that need to go in in terms of maybe uh, sales hiring and marketing spend and you know, there are a number of these variables that go into determining how much new revenue that we can add at any given time. And that's, kind of the primary exercise is to try and uh, come up with an ambitious goal and a target. And you're always trying to push against uh, uh, the edges, right? Because you don't want to, you know, when the overriding goal of a venture partner company is growth and and, as fast uh, as you can grow, Mm -hmm. you want to kind of push at the edges a little bit and challenge yourself to ask, can I do even better? Can I do even better? And what is it going to take to do even better? And those are the kinds of questions we ask ourselves as a leadership team also, right? Is that what are the other levels we can bring to bear, uh, you know, and what are the constraints we have to do that, right? Sometimes money is a constraint, sometimes ability to hire fast enough uh, is a constraint. You just need you know, a certain number of people, especially when it comes to sales and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the time it takes to onboard people and wrap them up uh, is a constraint. There are all of these kinds of constraints when you're thinking about a forecast of, what you want to do in the future and, and, and kind of are working towards a plan that allows you to get there, right? Okay, so I know that makes sense. Um, and just slightly on that, um, when a company is growing, there are periods of maybe negative uh, cash flow that might be useful because you're investing in some new product or development. Um, do you have any suggestions of how you know startups can handle that pressure? Because that's always, I'm imagining, kind of stressful to be in a negative cash flow state, even though you're projecting you're going to be positive. No, yeah, that's why value number one, mm-hmm. company value number one of Airbase is control your own destiny, right? Mm-hmm. And if there's one lesson I've learned, you know, having done uh, one startup and uh, exited it, and now doing another one, mm-hmm. um, that's the big one. Is that uh, you know, the number one reason companies die by far is because they run out of cash, right? And might seem obvious, but, uh, you know, that, that's uh, by far the number one reason why companies die. And so to really focus on making sure that you have enough cash in the bank uh, mm-hmm. is, is really important, right? Mm-hmm. Because um, ultimately nothing else matters if you can't pay uh, your employees a salary and, and you cannot continue to build the business because you don't have uh, enough cash and uh, you know, the way we've always approached uh, you know, the business at, at Airbase is to ask that question, how do we control our own destiny, right? And how do we always plan? And when you're forecasting and when you're coming up with a plan in terms of how much revenue you're going to bring in versus what your expenses are going to be, 
how do you always put yourself in a place where even in the worst case scenario, if mm-hmm. especially if you're a venture funded company, yes, you've taken some dollars to invest in advance of growth and things like that. What if nobody ever gave you a single dollar ever again? Right. Like what would uh, happen to your business? Are you still on track to uh, continue to be able to build it without running out of cash? And, and that's kind of the question you have to be asking yourself at all times. Are we building the business in a way where we are controlling our own destiny and the default plan is not, you know, I just go raise another round of funding or something like that, right? And so that always does not work out. And you know, especially for founders who are doing it for the first time, who might have started building their companies in a good funding environment and, and things like that, you know, it's easy to fall into the trap of the market. It's always going to be this way. I'll always have the opportunity to go raise more money and things like that, but it may not. The markets can turn at any time for any number of reasons. And you know, look at the pandemic that just happened, which you know, thankfully didn't have a huge impact on certain kinds of businesses. Obviously, other kinds were devastated and, and uh, things like that. But if you're in the lucky kind of bucket, maybe that was really good for you. But if you're in the kind of business that, that was impacted by a pandemic, it's hard to predict things like that, right? And right. so uh, always asking the question, okay, how do I control my own destiny? How do I make sure that I'm planning things in such a way that the revenue that I bring in mm-hmm. uh, you know, can ultimately make up for uh, the expenses of the business. Even if today uh, I'm, I'm kind of net negative, uh, is that a plan to get it to a point where you're cash flow positive? And, mm-hmm. and these are questions that I think management teams should always uh, um, you know, think hard about. Right. right. No, that makes that makes perfect sense. Um, so Tejo, that's that's really what I had today. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Is there any other advice you'd like to give uh, before we close up? No, uh, you know, no advice specifically other than what I've already said about, yeah. you know, about controlling your own destiny, especially if you're an early stage uh, startup that is just getting going. Uh, you know, so much of it is about persistence, and then and, and uh, it's about asking yourself how you can, um, you know control your own destiny as you go through that journey. And, uh, you know, uh, if you manage to make it past those very difficult, usually early years, and uh, it, it generally happens because the founders have been persistent and, and they believe in their vision and they've stuck uh, with the ups and the downs. Right. And uh, I wish the listeners the best if that's the situation they're in and, and hopefully can, you know, they can go build uh, awesome businesses, right? right.